Uh, hello and uh, welcome to the second webinar in CRG's webinar series, Borders of an Epidemic. This webinar is titled uh, COVID-19 Redrawn Borders, Redefined Lives. Most of you are aware of what CRG has been doing over the past 25 years. Uh, it began, began in 1996 uh, in the aftermath of Pakistan-India People's Forum for Peace's co annual conference and it became a uh, forum for activists, researchers, uh, and uh, civil society actors. For the past 25 years or so, CRG has been actively involved in uh, research, dialogue, and advocacy work. And CRG has also evolved as uh, the uh, single most important institution dealing with migration and forced migration studies. As part of that, uh, CRG annually hosts its winter workshop on forced migration studies, which is also scheduled to be held this year in November with a special emphasis on COVID-19. This specific uh, webinar series is a response uh, to, is uh, a continuation of and also a response to two of CRG's most recent publications. The first one was called Borders of an Epidemic, COVID-19 and Migrant Workers. Uh, edited by Professor Rano Bishwamadar, it looks at the ethical and political implications of the epidemic. And the second one, more recently published, was called uh, Burdens of an Epidemic, a Policy Perspective on COVID-19 and Migrant Labor. Also edited by Professor Rano Bishwamadar, it looks at who bears the cost of an epidemic and epidemic control measures. It asks who pays for an epidemic in terms of life and livelihood. We will begin this discussion session by keeping uh, in mind uh, some of the concerns that come out of uh, these two publications. We uh, have come to such a juncture in history where the coronavirus pandemic has emerged both as a public health crisis, a migrant crisis, and an economic crisis. Keeping this in mind, we ask questions about movement, sovereignty, governance, and about borders between people, between societies, and between states. In order to do so, uh, we are very, very happy to present to you uh, two exceptional scholars, but also experts in border studies. The first speaker for today is Professor uh, Sandro Mezadra. Professor Mezadra is an associate professor at University of Bologna. And incidentally, he is also a member of the International Advisory Committee of the Calcutta Research Group. Among his many publications, I will only mention three, uh, Border as Method or the Multiplication of Labor, The Politics of Operations, Evacuating Contemporary Capital, Excavating Contemporary Capitalism, and The Borders of Justice. Very recently, uh, in uh, Open Democracy, Professor Mezadra has published an article called What Happens to Freedom of Movement During a Pandemic? And this is one of the concerns that we are going to address today. I'm also very happy to introduce Professor Paula Banerjee to you, who is a professor at uh, Calcutta University uh, and a former president of uh, IASFM, as a, well as a former honorary director of CRG. Again, among many of her other works, Professor Banerjee has published Women in Indian Borderlands, The State of Being Stateless, and Borders, Histories, Existences. So, so the way we are going to proceed with today's webinar is, Professor Mezadra will first speak for about 25 minutes, followed by Professor Banerjee, who will speak for about 10 minutes. And then we will have a question answer session for about 15 minutes. So uh, if Professor Mezadra, you would kindly proceed from here. Thank you. Thank you, Samyata, and thank you to uh, the whole uh, staff of CRG for uh, inviting me to participate uh, in this uh, webinar. I will uh, start from uh, the question uh, of migration on which uh, I have uh, been discussing and collaborating uh, with uh, CRG for uh, many years uh, now. Migrants uh, are uh, definitely among uh, the people who suffer more from uh, the current uh, pandemic. The most uh, mobile subject 
uh, have been often compelled to endure conditions uh, of forced uh, immobility, be it uh, in Libyan uh, detention camps uh, on uh, the southern shore of uh, the Mediterranean, or in Mexico, where tens of thousands of trans migrants from Central America are stuck, caught in the double pincer of the army on the one hand and of criminal cartels on the other hand. But the predicament of migrants in a time of pandemic is not limited to such conditions uh, of forced uh, immobility. It can also coincide with uh, forced mobility. As you know too well from the case of the painful exodus of uh, internal uh, migrants in India that uh, is uh, so impressively discussed in uh, borders of uh, an epidemic, the CRG publication, the CRG instant book, to put it so, edited uh, by my friend uh, Ranabir Shamadar. This is a, a very important point, in my opinion, since it demonstrates uh, that uh, a defining feature uh, of uh, the pandemic and its management uh, is uh, a reorganization of the whole economy of uh, mobility and immobility with far reaching consequences for the structures and uh, for the subjective experience of uh, domination and uh, exploitation. Zhang Biao, a Chinese anthropologist based in Oxford, proposes the term shock mobility to describe the unusual traffic patterns that involved so-called essential workers in many parts of the world, ranging from public health to factory workers, from uh, riders working for delivery platforms uh, to workers uh, in logistical houses and uh, agriculture. Needless to say, many of such workers uh, are uh, migrants. And particularly if you look at Italy, a country where uh, I leave, you can say that uh, the geography of the pandemic, in particular after uh, the lockdown, coincides with the geography of the exploitation of migrant workers. But there is a need to frame such tales of migrants' pain and struggle within uh, a wider uh, picture. What does the pandemic say about the redrawing of borders in our present world? How does the pandemic look like once it is analyzed from the border? And what about the global scope of the pandemic? Let me uh, move uh, to uh, say something about uh, the global scope uh, of uh, the pandemic. The circulation of uh, the coronavirus uh, as being on the one hand uh, extremely quick and uh, it has hit uh, almost the whole globe, prompting the sudden emergence of uh, a global crisis. At the same time, however, the spread of the virus has been uh, profoundly uneven, shedding light 
on a panoply of borders, both between countries and regions, uh, and uh, within them. Colonial uh, legacies uh, have uh, shaped the circulation of the virus in many parts uh, of the world. For instance, in the US, where African Americans and Latinas have been disproportionately affected. And this is a crucial, important aspect of uh, to understand the dynamics of the amazing uprisings of the last uh, weeks. Or uh, in Brazil, where the same happened with indigenous people, as well as with blacks and the poor in general. So the combination of uh, homogeneity and heterogeneity is for me a defining feature of uh, global processes of uh, the global uh, as uh, such. In the work uh, I have been doing uh, with uh, Brett Nielsen since uh, Borderless Method, the book we published in uh, 2013, we have pursued a critical investigation of what we call actually existing the global processes from the epistemic viewpoint of the border. And we have challenged the prevailing image of the global as a quote and unquote border world, the smooth space as well as an entire conceptual language centered upon the opposition between flows and place. The point is that uh, global processes uh, are uh, definitely characterized by a high degree of homogeneity regarding their logics, regarding what we can call borrowing a term from uh, Deleuze and Guattari, they are axiomatic. But when those processes hit the ground, as we like to say, they are compelled to come to grips with a huge social, economic, political, cultural heterogeneity, multiplying rather than flattening that very heterogeneity. And this is a point that we have attempted. Uh, to demonstrate, for instance, uh, analyzing the spatial economic zones in China, new towns in India, of the impact of financialization in the huge metropolitan peripheries in Latin America. So a first point regarding the global, the spread of the COVID-19 epidemic is, uh, for me, a classical instance of uh, a global process. But let me now uh, take uh, a different uh, angle on the global, addressing uh, a topic uh, that uh, has also been uh, at the center of my long-term uh, collaboration with uh, CRG. One of the ways in which uh, I attempted uh, to study and describe global processes uh, over the last uh, 10 years uh, has been focusing attention on logistics. My own work on uh, logistics, uh, again, in particular with uh, Brett Nielsen, has been part of a dense fabric of uh, collaborations and political complicities in many parts of the world, including uh, Kolkata. We have all been part of a movement, a movement both of uh, research and of struggles that has deeply politicized the seemingly 
technical neutral question of logistics, turning it into a privileged point of entry into the critical study of uh, contemporary capitalism uh, writ uh, large. Just visit the website of uh, a collective of activist scholars based in Italy into the black box uh, to get uh, an idea of that. In a few words, what uh, Brett and I have attempted uh, to do is uh, to shed light on uh, what we call the skeleton of uh, capitalist globalization, made up of uh, a tight network of supply chains, spatial zones, corridors, conduits, pipelines, hubs, ports, submarine and land cables. And we emphasize that this uh, skeleton, this uh, logistical skeleton, mm -hmm, inscribes itself mm -hmm, with a special and even uh, jurisdictional autonomy onto the political map the political geography organized around the national norm and uh, international relations. Logistical spaces uh, are spaces of capital. And today, political spaces and spaces of capital look like two spheres uh, that should be articulated with each other in some way, but nevertheless are more and are more and more out of sync, disconnect. The disconnection is not only spatial, but also temporal. Supply, transport, and communication chains, interconnected communication networks, material as well as immaterial infrastructures, financial and exchange networks that compose spaces of capital produce their temporality according to criteria and standards that tend to become more and more autonomous from the world of states, the world order maybe better, the word disorder splits into two. And geopolitical borders struggle to contain, to incorporate, to discipline an economic spatiality whose working in turn reproduces precise lines of demarcation and deploys effects of command of inclusion and exclusion that have dramatic effects for the life of uh, entire population. Spaces of citizenship that borders should uh, circumscribe are violently disrupted by such effects and by the intensification of inequality that is uh, structurally connected, fair enough, one uh, would say at this point. This was uh, in a very schematic summary, our analysis of logistics uh, over the last uh, few years. But now we have to bring the COVID-19 pandemic back in. And the effect of the pandemic on uh, logistical spaces has been momentous. The logistical mega machine that I have uh, schematically described mm -hmm. was the first to stop with the start of 
the pandemic. In an impressive article published in the New York Times on May 22, and entitled, What Happened to the Great American Logistics Machine, David Siegel has described in a very effective uh, way the bewilderment, the very astonishment in front of the slowdown and in many cases uh, of the standstill of uh, the logistic world. Anyway, nowadays, the challenge to logistical rationality seems even more uh, radical. And, and consequently, forecasts of a coming de-globalization proliferate. Allow me to make uh, my point uh, in this regard uh, in a very focused and even uh, schematic uh, way. We can discuss about uh, it uh, later. I am convinced uh, that contemporary capitalism, uh, precisely due to its embedment within the logistical network uh, I described, can only be a global capital. But I immediately need to add uh, that uh, quote and unquote global capital. Uh, can have many different uh, meanings. It can refer to multiple modalities uh, of uh, spatial organization and uh, political mediation. In particular, global capitalism can be framed around processes of regionalization that were already underway before the pandemic, although among huge tensions and conflicts. And I think that uh, this uh, hypothesis of uh, an increasing uh, regionalization of uh, global capital is a hypothesis we should take into serious consideration and we should carefully discuss. So let me conclude with a couple of remarks on this topic of regionalization. When I speak of regionalization, I am, of course, taking regions uh, as spaces uh, than uh, nation states. But when I speak of regionalization, what I have in mind is neither a process that could be theoretically grasped with the notion of a pluralism of greater spaces forged by Carl Schmitt, nor the mere proliferation of more or less tightly integrated uh, regional organizations. And this is, first of all, because the disconnection between spaces of capital and political spaces that I have emphasized before seems to me to describe at least a medium term trend. Speaking uh, of uh, regionalization, I rather refer to the overlapping of operative spaces that both from an economic and from uh, a political as well as uh, legal point of view, trespass national space, raising unprecedented issues of regulation. The clash between the US and China is definitely crucial in uh, this regard. But I do not believe that the emerging world order and disorder 
can be articulated around this binary X. I do not believe that Asia and Latin America, to mention the two continents where the two conflicting powers are located, are good to align themselves without any friction with the US and China. There would be much more uh, to say here, but uh, I am running uh, out of time. So let me conclude with the enunciation of uh, a methodic uh, principle. I am convinced that uh, the kind of emerging uh, regional formations we will be confronted with in the next future will be a crucial consequences on the development of class struggle. And in turn, I am convinced that the development of class struggle in the widest possible sense of the term will shape processes of regionalization. As in the time of Lenin, geopolitics, Mm -hmm. seems uh, to me to be today an internal aspect of uh, class struggle. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Mezabra. Not merely because you introduced us to the logistical mega machine, the mapping of which CRG has also been a part of, but also for bringing our attention to the fact that this logistical mega machine was the first one which was crossing the uh, political and uh, national borders, but also one which has been stopped due to the pandemic. And also thank you so much for ending with this note of hope that uh, class struggle will be crucial to the formation of the regionalism, regionalization, which is now going to bring about a challenge. Uh, Professor Paula Banerjee, if you could kindly now uh, speak to us uh, about what you think. Thank you so much, Shomuta. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Because I know we have people from all over the world joining us. Sandro very eloquently talked about the disconnect between uh, the political space, which is the space of citizenship, and the space of capital. And, and he talked about how logistics sort of connects and disconnects these two spaces and, and um, ended up with a very hopeful note. I will talk about disjuncture of borders and disjunctures of capital of um, political spaces and violent ruptures in this reformation, reformulation of uh, borders and uh, well, geographical spaces as a result of uh, what we have today, the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, the thing is, I will start my, uh, and I think of myself as a storyteller rather than an analyst, I will start with the story of May 8th. We got up, switched on our televisions and found out that 16 migrant workers were actually following the spatial border, walking along the railway tracks and trying to get home. What happened was they fell asleep, trains were supposed to have stopped, and they were killed at the middle of the night. This is a picture that is constantly reiterated in front of us, because this was a transgression of the borders that was set up by the governing elite on the migrants, on the people who were seen as untouchables, as contaminants. The interesting thing about COVID-19 is what I think Professor Shomadar started talking about that in borders of pandemic. He said, this is a disease that was brought to us, not through you know, the poorer sections of the community, the poorer classes, but at least in India, it came home to us through the affluent classes. That is, I think, the only thing that was different between this 
and the pandemics that we have seen previously. Because we talked about, we talk about the violent reformulation of geographical spaces through wars. We hardly ever talk about the reformulation of geographical spaces through pandemic. But when we look at pandemic, we see that is exactly what happens. And what Sandra talked about, the spatial, the temporal borders, all of these borders somehow connect itself to two notions. And one is the notions of the unwanted, whether it's, it's you know, minorities, migrants, you know, you name it, races. And the other is always, you know, these spaces are always considered as something which is constantly reformulated to forces from outside. Exactly, you know, things that we sort of bring it up whenever we are analyzing wars. So, you know, the, this death of 16 migrant labor to me clearly shows the nature or the relations between borders and pandemics. When we started knowing, hearing about this pandemic, the COVID-19, what was amazing to us was this whole notion of the great leveler. What is the great leveler? It is a disease that is not class-based, that is not caste-based, that is not religion-based. You know, we had all heard about HIV and the pandemic, global pandemic, and we always thought that a disease like that was peripheral. A disease like that actually affected the poorer section of the population. World leaders said it's actually not HIV, it is actually poverty that brings in this disease, that brings in the, you know, the, the total mayhem that results out of this disease. So when novel coronavirus or the novel coronavirus came in, we thought, here is a pandemic that we are very nervous about because it doesn't sort of, um, you know, stop with the borders of uh, capital. It, it, it sort of breaks through all the different kinds of borders. And our response to that was, how do we manage a disease that subverts these sort of borders that we understand? So what do we do as a state, as a group of community? We start erecting borders. That is the reaction that for centuries we are used to whether it's plague, whether it's Spanish flu, any pandemic, HIV, we start erecting borders. And whenever we start erecting borders, we ultimately end up by making the vulnerable, the people who are outside of the borders. So when we started erecting borders around, you know, and we, those of us who have been working on borders like Sandro or even in a way myself, we have been talking about how the borders are coming back, constantly coming back. We used to think that national security and state borders actually created the uh, uh, sort of, you know, it was the end of all borders. Partition was meant to be end of all borders. So in this COVID-19 also, the way we reacted was that let us keep the borders and erect more borders and create, you know, lockdowns. And, but what were we locking ourselves in? What was the lockdown all about? What was these borders, you know, that were crumped, growing all over? And these borders proliferated into borders in the streets, borders in the districts in, let's say, May, I told you about May 8th. Look at what happened in May. 10th, May 12th, May 15th, places like Pitol, places like Kalaburgi, places like Middapur, you have thousands of people trying to question the borders because the borders were erected so that these borders subverted the whole notion of citizenship. No longer the alien is the foreigner, 
the alien is your next door neighbor. The alien can be the person you're staying at home. And the alien invariably is the migrant labor. The alien invariably is somebody who is from outside of your own particular space. It can be racial, it can be religious. So we have this whole Islamophobia out of uh, this meeting that was held in New Delhi. We have the whole coming back of Black Lives Matter, you know. So the whole notion was, you know, the, the way the Lacta lockdown happened was to depoliticize the political spaces and create border within the political spaces that was growing. In India was up in protest about NRC, about C CAA. So what happened was the erection of the spaces and the taking advantage of these sort of a mayhem situation and question the whole notion of citizenship. Citizens were no longer considered as safe. NRC talked about, you know, the protest against NRC talked about the recreation or the reclaiming of citizenship. COVID-19 showed us that it is not just NRC, but the whole notion of citizenship was in question. And what we had thought was actually an apolitical matter, pandemic, health, all of these were considered as apolitical. But now we see how it is politicized. Who are the people? The question that Dr. Shamardar raised in the volume, who are the people who are or who have to pay for these new borders that are being erected? There's different borders that are being erected. Of course, the same vulnerable communities who paid for the national security security borders. You know, it is the same group of people. It is never ever the affluent class that pays. The affluent class just locks itself and creates a border so that their affluence can be retained. So, you know, it was like the Chinese wall. The wall was not created to stop the outsider from coming in. The wall was created so that people from inside could not interact with the outside. The inside spaces could be depoliticized. And that is how you erect borders. And the outside political spaces were seen or were contained. It was seen that it could not in make inroads inside this depoliticized space. And this is how the state was also visualized. Within the state, you could not make encroaches because the roads were taken over, my friend. Ritu Jyoti Bandhapadhyay, in a very informal conversation, said, what do we have left, Pallavi, if the roads are taken over by the state? Because the roads are actually the logistical spaces that Sandra was talking about are the spaces of rupture, are the spaces of subversion, where always the vulnerable could come out, could claim. And if they do not have those spaces of claim making, then the borders that are erected will continue and the whole notion of subverting the borders will be depoliticized. So we need to question these borders and see why these borders are being created. You know, why lockdown inevitably means the lockdown of people's access to resources. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Paladi. If you uh, are listening to the webinar and if you haven't sent in your question yet, please send it to the host in the chat box. We will begin with a specific question, which is uh, but which can also be addressed to both of you. The specific question is uh, with the current migrant exodus, will big cities like Mumbai, who rely so much upon their work, recover and regain their economic uh, economic stability? Uh, and I would like to broaden this question up a bit for Professor Mezadra uh, to also ask, so what happens to now with the exodus of migrant workers, what happens to these logistical spaces, which are as much spaces of infrastructure as they are also of labor? So if he would also uh, reflect a bit on that. It's a big question. Uh, in Italy, uh, in Europe, uh, we did not have uh, such uh, 
a migrant exodus uh, as, uh, in India. Nevertheless, uh, there are uh, essential sectors of the economy that are not only predicated upon uh, migrant labor, uh, but also on the mobility of migrant labor. The most uh, uh, important uh, instance uh, in this regard uh, is possibly agriculture. The country like Italy, we have uh, an army of uh, tens of thousands of uh, black migrants who work in agriculture and move from one region to uh, another in order to follow the pace of uh, agricultural uh, production. Moreover, uh, we have thousands uh, of uh, migrants uh, coming from Eastern Europe uh, to work in agriculture uh, in Italy. The situation is not that different uh, in other European countries, but I will focus on uh, Italy. Over the last decade, uh, there has been uh, an attempt uh, to establish hierarchies between uh, these different groups of migrant workers and to use such hierarchies as uh, a tool for uh, the management of agricultural labor. With the pandemic, suddenly, the mobility of migrant workers within the country and the mobility of migrant workers from Eastern Europe were not at all possible. And that was a really huge problem for a vital sector such as uh, agriculture. In a way, you can say that uh, uh, public opinion in Italy was uh, suddenly compelled to realize the relevance of migrant labor for uh, the reproduction of social life in the country for food. And I think it is uh, important uh, uh, to stress that uh, even during uh, the lockdown, uh, there was uh, a very strong mobilization of uh, migrant workers uh, in agriculture, of Black African migrant workers in agriculture. There was a general strike in the fields on May 21st. And uh, maybe the process of self-organization and struggle of migrant workers in agriculture has been kind of uh, prompted and facilitated by the very tough conditions of uh, the pandemic. And this is just to conclude uh, once again on a note uh, of uh, hope. So it is not difficult for me to imagine uh, what uh, should have, uh, what must have happened uh, in uh, a metropolis like Mumbai with uh, the migrant exodus uh, that we experienced uh, in India. Um, Shomota, my take on this question about the exodus of the migrant workers from Mumbai, or for, mat or for that matter, any big metropolitan town, is that, you know, um, attacks against the migrants is not new in these cities. Migrants have always been there to be, you know, and to be sort of their lives were um, completely under, uh, you know, uh, control and they were their lives were constantly under uh, control. 
But, uh, and so uh, the migrant workers, you know, uh, with the spread of disease, when they were sort of forced out of the cities, people didn't realize that 90% of the economy was based on the migrant workers. And, and now what we see is a phenomena where there is a sort of an invitation to migrant workers to come back, you know, to, you know, what do you do uh, in this sort of situation? You never privilege the notion of health of the migrant workers. You always privilege the notion of their labor. And, and so states are now encouraging people, actually even within the lockdown, to go back to these areas. And I know Sandra is hopeful. He said that it would be good, you know, this sort of a situation might be a win-win for the migrants and they can, you know, the, the new sort of uh, subaltern movements can be generated. But I am much less hopeful about that. You know, I, I wish um, that that was true, but with the potential of the states to recreate borders, with the potential of the states to, not just states, but governing mechanisms to control the migrant body, or for that of the female body, or for that matter, anybody, any sexuality that needs to be controlled, um, you know, there's going to be new formulations where even when there's a reworking of the city space, there will be new borders, new boundaries erected. But uh, this is a question of struggle. My only hopeful bid in this is that the struggle will continue. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll come to the next question. The next question is to Professor Mezadra, uh, directed uh, actually by the one person who asked the question to Professor Mezadra. Do you think that the divergence between logistical space and political space in a way that quarantines the political space from taking off the reconfigured logistics of uh, global capital? So is the divergence between the logistical space and the political space, has, uh, has it led to such a situation in which the political space is quarantined from taking over the reconfigured logistics of global capital? This is the question to Professor Mezadra. And the question to Professor Banerjee is, uh, the logics of spread of disease, of return movements of migrants and of supply chains, are they the same or are they in conflict with each other? If it is so, what are the implications for a logistically oriented economy? And I would request Professor Mezadra to also weigh in on this uh, later. Yeah, sure. This is again a uh, uh, very important but also difficult uh, question. Uh, my point is uh, that the, de the, the development uh, of uh, logistics uh, of uh, supply chains in particular uh, over the last uh, couple of decades uh, has uh, been uh, drawing a geography that cannot be superimposed on the political geography dominated by uh, uh, nation states. I think this is an important uh, uh, aspect of uh, the current uh, capitalist uh, transition. Of course, states uh, are involved in the production of uh, logistical uh, spaces. They are involved uh, since uh, uh, they contribute uh, to uh, the very uh, start, to the very opening of uh, uh, logistical spaces. Uh, and in the sense that uh, they participate uh, in the governance of logistical uh, spaces. But if you look at that governance uh, in detail, uh, it is very clear that uh, the rationality of uh, governance in logistical spaces uh, is not a political rationality. <laughs> 
in uh, the sense of uh, a state rationality. It is rather uh, a logistical, which means uh, a capitalist uh, rationality. So from this point uh, of view, uh, you can uh, speak of a process of immun immunization of uh, logistical spaces uh, from the political intervention of uh, uh, states. And this is a, a, a very important uh, uh, question, of course, uh, that uh, uh, I would like to address, uh, first of all, from the point of view of uh, the struggles, the ruptures, as uh, Paula was saying before, uh, that uh, characterize the logistical spaces. Uh, Professor Banerjee, if you would uh, talk about the return yeah, of the I migrant. Mean, yeah, the return of the migrant. Well, um, the return of the migrant is also not really a return. You know, it's it's another movement in this. You know, we constantly think of movements of migrants in in a sort of a cyclical mode, but uh, you know, this uh, the, this uh, the leaving of the migrants from the metropolitan cities or from uh, the, you know the places where they worked was characterized as a return and it wasn't a return then and now again it is being characterized as a return a return of the return and it is still not a return now you know the the thing is um, to me the relevant question is it is it is a new movement and in any new movement, the question is who gets the uh, sort of the space to control that movement? And definitely the migrants will never get the space to control the logistical spaces. So there's going to, the migrants are now embarking on a new movement. And probably this new movement is a movement of subversion. So the migrants will keep on trying to subvert. One of these days, maybe we will have a subaltern uprising or whatever that is to reclaim the spaces, to reclaim the logistical spaces. But as of now, you know, this new movement augurs a difference, but whether that difference is a positive is something that, you know, jury is still on, on that question. Uh, Professor Mizadra, final question to you uh, it's from Professor Shamadar, which is about the logic of spread of disease, of return movements of migrants and of supply chains. So the logic of spread of disease, return movement and supply chain, are they the same or are they in conflict with each other? Uh, and what are the implications of a logistically oriented economy keeping these three logics in mind? So final comments from you. Well, thank you for the, uh, this question. Uh, uh, it could be uh, the start of uh, a new webinar. I think uh, there are contradictions between uh, the three logics uh, mentioned by uh, Renabil. The spread of uh, disease, uh, the spread of uh, the virus uh, as uh, produced uh, many frictions uh, in the working of uh, supply chains. Return movements of uh, migrants uh, have uh, challenged the continuity of production and reproduction in many urban as well as rural spaces. So my point is that in order to relaunch a logistically oriented economy, these three logics uh, have uh, uh, to be uh, articulated in a way 
that uh, I don't uh, see uh, right uh, now. Uh, supply chains, but logistics in general uh, is predicated upon uh, uh, migrant labor. There is uh, a very strict connection between uh, logistics uh, and uh, migration. And of course, uh, uh, the spread uh, of the virus uh, is a kind of unforeseen variant uh, that we have to take into consideration if uh, we are uh, to uh, grasp uh, current uh, uh, trends uh, in uh, economy and uh, society. It is quite clear that uh, we are not going to get rid of uh, the virus uh, in the next uh, couple of months, that uh, we will have uh, to uh, come to grips, uh, to live together uh, with uh, the virus uh, in uh, the next months. And uh, if you uh, buy uh, the point uh, of uh, environmental uh, scholars, but also of a radical feminist like uh, Donna Haraway, <laughs> the presence uh, of uh, viruses, uh, the presence of epidemics and pandemics uh, will uh, be a defining feature of our condition uh, in the next years and uh, decades. So from this point of view, we have uh, to uh, make sense of the way in which uh, we can uh, address the virus, in which we can live together with the COVID-19 virus, but more generally with the viruses. It is uh, uh, a politically important question. First of all, because uh, it leads to uh, take public health uh, as uh, a crucial field of uh, political experimentation and uh, investment, as a crucial field of uh, struggle. So I want to uh, conclude once again uh, on a note uh, of uh, hope by saying that uh, the pandemic uh, has uh, many terrible kind of implications, many people die, but it also opens up the space uh, in which uh, new struggles uh, can uh, invent a new way of managing uh, public health. My optimism uh, is uh, never disconnected uh, from uh, struggles. Uh, from this point of view, I completely agree with Paula. <laughs> I mean, it's a field of struggle, but it's a field of struggle that is open nowadays in many parts of the world. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor Mezabra. Thank you, Professor Banerjee. So we began by thinking about those most mobile populations, which have now been forcibly immobilized, but also at the same time, those populations which are now being forced to move, to go back, to go back to the places they had come from, the cities, the countries. And we also took into consideration the borders which we thought were resolved, which are now being redrawn into smaller, smaller spaces, perhaps outside our gated communities, perhaps right outside our cities. So keeping both of these two in mind, uh, also thank you, Professors Banerjee and Mezadra, for ending with a note of hope uh, of a resurgent belief in struggle, or albeit the spaces of struggles might be divergent. Thank you to all of the participants for joining us today. Uh, we shall. May I add uh, just, uh, I add just uh, two words? Yes, mm -hmm. please. Mm, on the question uh, of uh, the migrant exodus uh, uh, in India and uh, on the difference of the situation uh, in a country like Italy, but uh, more generally in Europe. Mm -hmm. The exodus is possible uh, in India because migrants uh, are largely internal migrants. In uh, a country like Italy, 
uh, there was uh, no home <laughs> to which uh, uh, to start a return for uh, migrants. And this is because on the one hand, uh, uh, transport was blocked <laughs> and is still largely blocked. So it was not possible for migrants to go back to Senegal, just to make an example. <laughs> But on the other hand, it was also because uh, we have uh, a larger uh, part of migrants uh, who are uh, illegalized, <laughs> who have no paper. <laughs> this means that they cannot uh, travel. <laughs> I was speaking because, uh, before uh, of migrant labor in agriculture. Uh, <laughs> Uh, most migrant labors, most African migrant labors uh, in uh, the fields uh, in southern Italy are uh, illegalized migrants. And this is the reason why uh, one of the main claim in uh, the uh, struggles of migrant workers employed in agriculture is an amnesty, is a legalization. And with many limits, uh, with many limits, uh, a legalization procedure uh, was started by the government uh, in Italy. For uh, uh, agricultural workers uh, and for uh, care and domestic uh, workers. Hmm. This is quite interesting because these are uh, two uh, essential sectors. I mean, and during, during the pandemic and particularly during the lockdown, there was uh, a lot of talk uh, uh, about essential workers. And definitely both uh, uh, agricultural uh, workers and uh, uh, domestic and care workers figure among uh, the essential workers. And now migrants are in a way uh, pushing in order uh, to uh, overcome the limits of this procedure of uh, uh, legalization. <laughs> and this is part uh, of uh, a struggle, a more general struggle for freedom of movement, uh, to have the possibility to return home, <laughs> you know, uh, because now uh, they have no, they have this possibility because of, the, uh, of their uh, legal citizenship status. Uh, Shomata, can I just chip in? The other thing about Indian workers is that what Sandra was talking about is the legality, the question of legality. But Indian workers were also up here, you know, and that is why the level of politicization was in certain ways greater. And, and that is why they could up and leave. But the point is now, by reclaiming their bodies once again, there is this process of trying to depoliticize them, which has to be recognized. And so I think, uh, you know, Indian workers should not lose their momentum to reclaim their political space. That's it. Okay. With that note, we shall end today's webinar. Thanks to all of the participants for joining us today. Thank you to the uh, to CRG for hosting this. Uh, CRG has uh, made uh, taken a note of all of your email addresses, and you will be informed in future about all the things that we host. Thank you so much once again.